great deal of this talk is similar to Jerry's, but it covers different details in a very different place. It was also the, the projects in Mauritania I'll talk about um, were also commercial developer funded projects um, in which cultural heritage aspects were assessed to promote environmentally sound and sustainable development and limit reputational and legal risk to the developers and funding institutions. Um, we worked in partnership with local experts alongside teams of ecologists, hydrologists and socio-economists. Um, did a whole series of surveys prior to major developments such as mines, water pipelines, power lines, power stations and so on. Um, and as with Jerry's discussion of social license to operate, um, international companies operating in the global marketplace are now beginning to face up to their social and ethical responsibilities um, and their public diplomacy policies are becoming increasingly sophisticated. It may be in life and self-interest or it may be a slightly greener form of greenwash and more ethical business models but the outcomes are slowly, steadily and very slowly sometimes making uh, projects slightly more socially and environmentally acceptable. So it involves challenging standards and expectations at all levels, as Jerry said, both in government um, and in local institutions and academic outfits. It also involves challenging the clients to think about other ways of doing things. It's also not just archaeology. Um, it's intangible heritage as well as uh, lithics and pottery. It also covers paleontology, history including uncomfortable and conflict histories, culture, art, religion. Um, and the idea of exchange was brought up early on in this, in this session. There's a an American definition of cultural diplomacy is that it's the exchange of ideas, information, art and other aspects of culture among nations and their peoples to foster mutual understanding. And this very high-minded and profound goal can, at a pinch, <coughs> be a long-term spin-off of these kinds of projects. So, zooming into Mauritania, it's a crossroads between cultures linking North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. It's the fourth largest country on the continent by area. It's largely desert. It's multi-ethnic with complex caste systems and some negative cultural practices, including slavery, force feeding, and female genital mutilation, which are still practiced in some parts. There's overall a generally low life expectancy and there are low literacy rates. In Mauritania, many people live close to the edge and are heavily influenced by climatic conditions um, and depend on the very careful stewardship of their ecosystems. During the Sahel droughts of the 70s and 80s, nomadic herding was largely abandoned, resulting in an enormous population shift to the capital city. The rise of Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb has devastated their nascent desert ecotourism industry. Prices are high, food insecurity is rife, and there's a resulting dependence on government subsidies and annual distributions of rice, oil and dates. The main exports are raw minerals, uh, iron, copper and gold, and also lots of fish, which are heavily fished from their waters by various other countries and their own. Um, these raw minerals exports aren't um, ideal in terms of an economic balance that way. Um, the country is in some ways being drained of its resources. It has extreme environmental issues, desertification, drought, land mines from previous wars and locust infestation. However, cultural heritage can be directly linked to economic development. For example, they did try before the latest um, difficulties with Al-Qaeda to develop the cultural industries and tourism 
traditional livelihoods and micro enterprises and to get the cultural infrastructure and institutions moving. I'll come to this in a moment. But firstly, and very importantly in the context of UK soft power discussions, Mauritania is a former French colony. <coughs> there's a lot of baguettes and there's some very, very fine breakfast baked goods, but there's no British embassy. There's no British council. The nearest embassy is in Dakar um, or in Rabat in Morocco. Um, Differed focuses on English-speaking countries, and most of Mauritania is in a foreign Commonwealth, Commonwealth opposite. It's a red no-go zone due to Al-Qaeda activities um, running across the desert to Libya. Moving on to UK-Mauritanian relations, because there are some, just. In 1960, when Mauritania became independent, MP Sir Peter Tapsell, who was then very young, attended the Independence Day ceremony. Nothing happened then until 2000 when um, the UK cancelled Mauritania's outstanding debt as part of the millennium celebrations. In 2010, this is 50 years after the first visit, UK exports to Mauritania were worth about £43 million. UK imports of Mauritanian goods, mainly raw iron ore, 2.4 million. So enormous trade imbalance there. And a British delegation visited Mauritania six years ago, 2011, against the backdrop of the Arab Spring, um, led by MP Daniel Kavaczynski, a member of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. And there he is with the President. The then Foreign Secretary, William Hague, visited shortly afterwards and said he wished to, to engage with Mauritania as serious partners in security and foreign policy, and is looking at ways that we can help Mauritania in political reform, good governance and human rights, all of which are essential to Mauritania's future development. So very noble. Um, in 2012, Mauritanian embassy opened in London. Its t website hi highlights tourism and archaeological sites. They specifically mentions archaeology on the, on the embassy's website. However, the UK has not yet opened any embassy or British Council office in Nuak shot in a spirit of reciprocity. So, Mauritania, as I mentioned earlier, it, had, it has had some work on its institutions. It received a World Bank grant of $5 million in 2000 for a five-year program to support heritage protection and enhancement. This enabled them to draft the core heritage legislation. They started strategic planning for their tourism. Um, they successfully nominated uh, the World Heritage Sites, the four ancient cities in the northeast of the countries. 33,000 medieval manuscripts from the desert libraries were digitized. And they rationalized the various inherited state institutions um, and built, also built up local heritage craft and music festivals. It didn't manage. One of the aims of this program was to set up a national heritage inventory. Uh, um, but that never happened, unfortunately, because due to disagreements um, over how to do it, and also, once it's done, how to prevent looting of the identified and mapped sites. This World Bank um, grant was also supported by UNESCO, by the French Development Agency, by the French Ministry of Culture, and also by the American Embassy. So you can see who's, who has interests here, and, uh, and it's, 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 it's not, not the UK, principally. Um, I work with a company called ACOM. It's one of those multinationals. Um, and this company and its legacy organizations have been undertaking cultural heritage work in Mauritania since 2010 as part of wider environmental impact assessment projects, um, principally mining projects, iron ore and gold. We've worked both for private mining companies and also for the National Mining Organization. We worked in partnership with the Institut Mauritanien de Recherche Scientifique and with Mauritanian socio-economic and governance experts. Um, and our work has been monitored by the Ministry of Culture and the de Department of Environmental Control. So it is monitored by these new emerging national institutions 
who are have used these as a as partly as a sort of test bed for what can be required of uh, developers going forwards. Together, we surveyed over 800 square kilometres of mining concession areas and 1,200 kilometres of linear infrastructure routes. Um, we mapped and recorded probably o over 1,200 archaeological sites. Here's um, colleagues um, recording Neolithic rock art from the Green Sahara period. There's cattle, there's dancing figures, there's archers, and also some rather sort of hypnotic geometric designs. Um, early Paleolithic tools, which have added usefully to the national um, pattern distribution. Lots of Neolithic occupation from, from slightly wetter times or different times. Some rather spectacular proto-historic tombs and also military remains from the uh, colonial period. Um, people were very, very pleased to discuss military, colonial and recent heritage and found it very cathartic and interesting to discuss it and to um, put it out there. The, the local archaeologists were not only interested in, in prehistory, in early prehistory, but they really wanted to explore their own feelings about recent heritage and traumatic heritage. And he is more, uh, including um, spent cartridge cases from the, the Polisario War in the 70s. Um, and also Islamic graves, there were a great number of them, and they're quite sensitive in terms of local populations being attached to them and not wanting the dead to be disturbed. Um, and the country is slowly developing ways of balancing or allowing change within areas with isolated burials um, and to have burials relocated to safe places, which certainly 20, 30, 40 years ago would have been um, a point which could not have been discussed. The mine would have to have been moved. So attitudes are changing, there is a realism, but there is also a great respect for some elements of the national heritage. Practical things. Um, technical and logistical assistance, as, as Jerry said, it, it's, it's um, a long way from anywhere and it takes a, a while to get anywhere. Um, development assistance can take the form of anything from providing decent vehicles and fuel to, to accommodation and water. Um, this kind of capacity building and development systems on a logistical level also plays into getting the job done better by happy people um, and can help in an indirect way to promote and influence local and international standards. It enables the job to be done. There's no longer the excuse of, oh, it's awfully far away, we can't do it. Um, oh, oh, we can't get the cars there. Oh, we haven't got any survey methods. No, we've got GPS. And we've got decent cars and fuel. Crack on them. So many developing countries have got detailed cultural heritage legislation derived from colonial administrations or recently drafted in this country's case, but don't have the capacity to implement it. As people coming in from the outside, we need to be very careful and identify areas where international and local law policy and guidance are in conflict or unclear in order to justify and apply what we would consider to be just to, to be best practice. Um, and it's important to establish the expectations of the regulators, such as the Ministry of Culture here, in order to understand the content and the reasons for standard practice before introducing clever new approaches, which may not be remotely appropriate or feasible. <coughs> Here's an example is one of my colleagues setting out a site grid using very high-tech survey equipment provided by the mining company. It's not available to local archaeologists. They could have borrowed it, but they haven't had the training on how to use it. Um, these kind of innovative practices might be very good on a one-off basis, but they're not sustainable due to the lack of skilled local heritage specialists able to undertake this kind of um, 
site set up work. In fact, we set the site up for them so they could get on with doing the bit they did want to do and could do quite happily um, without, without um, further inputs. Here is, in contrast, a very simple and basic method of site protection, wooden posts and hazard tape to stop bulldozers <coughs> and um, happy young uh, pickup truck drivers from the mine site driving over sites. Um, it's low cost, it's readily available, it doesn't take long to knock it in, and it keeps things happy. So terrain and context appropriate approaches are necessary in the long run, and it's important that these kind of methods can be replicated by local staff. Um, also, we need to develop long-term partnerships rather than piecemeal single project interventions. Um, incremental change might be slow, but if, as in this case, we've been working on several projects in succession over the course of, I think, six years or so, we can test and develop appropriate methods and approaches with the local partners and refine techniques going forward, gradually working our way towards workable solutions that could be widened out more broadly. As mentioned by Jerry, there are a number of issues in developing local capacity um, and there are few archaeologists in Mauritania. There are some truly fabulous people, but there aren't very many of them. Um, <coughs> this, the bit of what I say now is, is, is occasionally about Mauritania, but also about other places I've worked in where the issues that Jerry raised on, on um, staffing apply as well. And people really make a project and without the people we're all sunk so the main thing is to is to look at this this aspect from my perspective local experts can be excellent academics they may well be trained overseas in the ex-colonial power but due to lack of of local opportunities and funding they may not have undertaken field survey or excavation for many years or even in their own country they may well lack practical experience um, in some cases they may have a great academic qualification, a high-ranking public sector heritage position, and a fabulous relationship with politicians, but this is not necessarily linked to technical or ethical standards. They may be urban government employees remote from local communities. In some cases, local experts may seek to protect their status and income by attempting to control or limit access to other, to other experts and also to young archaeologists. So there may be fiefdoms that need to be negotiated. And, and one thing is it, it, it can be important to um, engage local archaeologists via museums and academic departments um, and national institutions to ensure that the funding goes directly to these institutions rather than to well-connected individuals who may wish to maintain their, their consultancy monopoly. There are massive opportunities for local students and early career practitioners to be involved in both survey and excavation work, particularly if they have generous and thoughtful local mentors who are keen to train up the next generation. Um, I had a colleague in Mauritania who was heading for retirement and was immensely proud because he had, he had managed to encourage the woman out of the labs and into the field, and for decades there had been a kind of, oh, a woman can't work, work a woman can't dig, it's, it's awful, terrible, hard, hard labour, and they won't enjoy it, and it's not good for them, and they're better off doing things with beautiful, tiny things in a lab. And it all changed. She came on site, and she was absolutely fantastic, and she's part of the new up-and-coming generation who can, can do many, many different things and are perfectly happy to, to lead field work. Um, one important thing has been mentioned about, we talked about foreign archaeologists coming in and helping. I think it's very important that we ensure that foreign archaeologists do not exploit or undermine or disadvantage archaeologists in developing countries. <coughs> People need to excavate their own heritage. The techniques seen in this image here may not necessarily be our techniques or our brands of trowel or our brands of brush on sand. However, it's people who are learning to dig a test pit 
on one of the first excavations in 30 years that's developer funded. There's awful lot of PPE in that image as well. It's really quite a staged set special shot, but the fact that it's there at all really, really, really delights me. Um, we need to enable tech training. There's been talk about, about commercial market share. We don't need to take market share from people who need to practice archaeology in their own countries on their own heritage. Um, we need to enable people to research, explore, share, analyse and publish their own heritage. This is not about going overseas to the sunshine and somehow teaching foreigners things. It, that's an awful, terrible, bad thing and deprives these people of their livelihoods. Um, So it is also important that international colleagues collaborate as, as equal partners and share data, enabling local experts to develop, develop their own archives, their own publication systems, and to gain credit for their own discoveries, which means enabling the local archaeologists to carry the process out from start to finish and beyond the presentation which involves, again, educating developers as to their long-term funding commitments. Um, ideally, one day local communities will be able to investigate and record and pass on their heritage to future generations. At the moment, from my perspective, the main opportunities for this currently focus on intangible heritage and built heritage cons conservation projects in Mauritania. Um, I think overall the images you've seen have shown some interesting things, some slightly strange things, some unusual and nascent um, fieldwork practices which as, as work goes along it's been tailored to the sites that are being discovered. But it has resulted in the first systematic developer-led fieldwork, including the first large-scale excavations in the area since probably the 70s or 80s. Mauritania suffers from endemic poverty and illiteracy. Looting of heritage has been a bane since the 19th century, encouraged by colonial collectors, and it's still extensively practiced to supplement incomes. Local community understanding and appreciation of archaeology and heritage may be limited with little interest in the non-commercial aspects of heritage. The protection of heritage is important to developers to avoid political risk and gain legitimacy, credibility and trust, but also to ensure that their social license to operate is, is earned and maintained. Um, we developed cultural heritage awareness training programs for mine site staff, including inductions, um, highlighting the illegality of looting and souvenir hunting and exporting artefacts, partly because if this gentleman was uh, caught trying to go home on his, on his um, rotor, trying to go off for three weeks, with any of these in his pocket, he could have been arrested and locked up and brought his employer into potentially quite, quite a lot of disrepute. So it goes both ways. There's, there's, there's ways of raising awareness which, which protect more than just the heritage and which are in the interests of both mine site staff and um, mining companies here. It's important to engage with local partners to develop good governance systems, demonstrating transparency and accountability, and building the abilities of local institutions to manage their own heritage. All negotiations on heritage need to be open and accountable, and and transparent with careful meeting minutes and and really plain and clear decision making. Here's um, some public uh, consultation meetings which included graphic information on archaeology informing the local people about their own rich heritage. Um, but it, that this needs to go both ways, it's not just the information side of it, it's also 
partnership, participation, and goes right through to small socioeconomic groups having having discussions um, with with uh, local local people about their own interests. Um, as noted before, we need to have a meaningful dialogue uh, and respect local cultural norms. And in this situation, also work very carefully, as, as with Jerry's in, in Mongolia, to avoid disadvantaging vulnerable um, minority groups. So here's a ballot box, which was quite exciting <coughs> at the time. It's, it gives people a relatively rare voice, to, uh, opportunity to voice their, their views and concerns. The ballot box there, the green thing, um, is quite symbolic in a country with restricted democratic practice and relatively low ratings for political rights and civil liberties. Um, the expectations of ministry officials can be raised by providing detailed survey and fieldwork reports, raising the bar and setting standards going forwards. Here is a workshop um, funded and supported by one of our mining clients which was discussing um, training methods and um, how to move forward with rescue archaeology across the country. Um, this, this, this is also a, a pleasing thing to see people get together and discuss practice with again with lots of lots of different actors um including the ministry the researchers and the, the the mining mining clients um heritage management is possible and can and should be undertaken within national and international law and local and cultural religious norms and the case studies of good practice are an important tool for the regulators to enable them to enforce action and raise the bar. Each project, each of these projects was individually quite small, but put together they enable the, us to raise the reasonable expectations and demands of these heritage agencies um, and also to raise the expectations of the local archaeologists there and the communities experiencing um, strange people driving through in pickups. Um, who eventually realised what we were doing and and were able to form part of this virtuous cycle of, of working together. So museums, there is a grand national museum in the capital, but there are very lo limited local museums, mainly sponsored by um, ex-colonial state-owned enterprises or set up by passionate individuals. There is enormous potential for setting up and supporting small local museums with a view to attracting green and desert tourism one sunny day when the troubles are over, linking to microfinance traditional craft initiatives and providing educational resources. There are ongoing UN funded um, projects supporting cultural enterprises, including uh, traditional crafts and regional cultural and music festivals. Um, Microcredit lines have been established for local cultural tourism and handicraft activities such as jewellery, fabrics and paintings. Um, and they also focus again on, on vulnerable groups, building the capacities of women's associations and craft groups and associations of artists. Uh, there's one example in the centre at the bottom there is uh, a women's uh, craft collective which um, is largely staffed by widows who've got no other means of support and make uh, polish rocks and make jewellery. It's important to build lasting and sincere relationships with our counterparts <coughs> in the countries. Um, here's two colleagues playing, playing draft in the sand. Um, this goes along with the long-term approach and not just dipping in and out, um, and not just doing go, going in in the short term and and abandoning sort of half begun projects. Um, 
it's important to maintain that continuity so that the project sponsors get to fully understand the local contexts and values and traditions as well as the wider political and economic and security context of their developments. It may be necessary to uh, anticipate potential conflicts, identify interest groups and where possible work out constructive approaches. Again, this isn't the usual job of archaeologists necessarily in the UK, but there's other things that, that need, to be, need to be done to get things to work. So to conclude, establishing stable and serious relationships and networks is key, um, and single project campaigns may not have a long-term effect. And again, a word mentioned earlier, humility. Humility is absolutely crucial, and it's very important to take advice from the locals and to acknowledge the very great limits of our own expertise. Thank you.